Good morning. Good morning, good morning. How you doing, Chris? Good to see you, sir. I didn't get a chance to poke my head in your class. It's good to see you guys back. It's good to be back. Good morning this morning. All right. I know school starts this week, so we'll be praying for you guys today. And I don't just say that flippantly. We actually will be taking time out of our service to pray for our students, our teachers. In fact, I know this announcement will come later, but since, since I'm kind of on topic right now, tomorrow we will also uh, be feeding the, uh, the staff, the faculty, uh, the administration of uh, Blanco Independent School District. Uh, we have invited them over. And so, um, where is she? If you want to help with that, if you want to help decorate, if you want to help serve, uh, Miss Rhonda Carr is the person to talk to. Where is Miss Rhonda? Oh, is she, is she back there in the kitchen? Well, we will see about getting her to wave her hand earlier or later. But we're very excited. We've been doing this for several years and uh, obviously had to take a year off, uh, right? Um, but back at it, had an opportunity to do it last year. And so, uh, again, tomorrow, feeding the faculty and staff of our Blanco schools. And so I encourage you to, to talk to Miss Rhonda. If you don't know who she is, come talk to me, and I will introduce you uh, to her. But it is great to be back with y'all. I missed y'all last week, uh, but I know our friend Robbie Partain was here. And, man, I trust you guys had a wonderful time uh, with him. And so as we, as we get going, we're going to read from Psalm 119. So if you could stand with me to honor the reading of God's word. We're going to begin in Psalm 119. This psalm celebrates God's word, and the psalmist writes, Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. So let's lift our voice and ask the Lord to open our eyes to his glory and the beauty of his word this morning.
Hey guys, we're singing Open the Eyes. Here it goes, just by ourselves. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Come on, let me see. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see I want to see. Everybody's going to do your part. Here we go. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. One more time. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high lifted. To see you high and lifted up. You shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, everybody. Holy, holy. Rebecca's going to do a song for us. She's joining us this morning on piano. Thank you, Miss Rebecca. She's going to do a song. If you know the words, uh, I encourage you to sing right along with her. you 
salvation you chased down my heart through all of my failure and pride on the hill you created light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and as you speak See your heart and everything you've done. Every part designed in a work of art called love. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. I can see your heart a billion different ways. Every precious one. Child, you died to save. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one. Is it good? Hey, there we go. <laughs> My bad, guys. Bottom, but it wasn't working. All right, I don't know. Um, anyway, good morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord, right? Yeah. Hey, and you know what? If we don't cry out, the rocks will cry out. So that was a good song, good encouragement, uh, good word. And uh, as a dad, I'm excited to see my daughter play and sing, uh, not because she's made to, but because she is praising her risen king. And uh, years ago before, it was just lip service, but uh, it was sweet to see her worship the Lord because it was, it was there. So that, what a blessing it is as a dad uh, to see that. And I'm, I, am, I am just, uh, was a little tearful to, wow, Lord, she's really praising you. She's not just singing good. She's praising you. And this is good. Lord, I just thank you that you are good. And Lord, it just, it's, it's mind-boggling that how stupid, how much of a screw-ups we are, that you pursue us, that you love us, and you would go to the ends of the earth to grab us in our mess. Oh, Lord, I'm just humbled. I don't even know if I can do announcements. Lord, I'm just in awe that you saved me. You saved my daughter. You saved 
Uh, maybe people that we're still praying for. I pray that we would not forget how good you are and that we would be persistent to seek your face on behalf of those that don't know you and that we would not stop praying until we see them saved. Father, thank you that you are good. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, a couple good announcements uh, to get my thoughts back on the right page here. We have a whole bunch of stuff going on. If you have not had a chance to get your bulletin, we have a bunch of things in there. August 24th is a meeting that's coming up. We'd like you to be involved in children's ministry. We have, look in there, there's a save the date for August 28th. There's a whole bunch of stuff in your bulletin. Make sure you see that this Saturday is the third Saturday where we have a kids thing going on. Miss Diana Blackburn's taking care of that. But she had a couple announcements. They're going to drop off here at 10, and your pickup will not be here. It will be pickup at the Henry House. Uh, they're going to go and bless those folks over there. So also come and help make brown bags special for the uh, residents. They'll come and do something sweet for them. So if you want to drop off your kiddos this Saturday, the 20th, that would be great. Pastor Bill, I don't think I have any other announcements that uh, on my list if you want to take over. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Good to be back. And uh, one of the things that I want to uh, also announce as, uh, as you, you don't see it in your worship guide except by a reference. So, um, one, you see uh, next week we're doing our members meeting. It was postponed last week, uh, last month, so it's the 21st, and we'll also be observing Lord's Supper next week. If uh, members, if you haven't seen or picked up a proposed budget, we're going to vote on that two weeks from today. Okay, so that's... Members, there are a couple stacks of these on the desk. You've got two weeks to overview it, to look at it, to ask questions. Uh, and then next, well, two Sundays from now, uh, during our service, we'll vote on it without discussion, right? I mean, you've got two weeks for discussion, so there is a chance for discussion. We're just not going to do that in here. Uh, so um, please pick that up, and then you can contact myself, the office, um, and we'll either answer questions or forward you to those who can. So that is, that is the budget, and that is our special called meeting uh, that is going to be on the 28th. Um, other than that, I think the only other thing I wanted to announce just briefly, and, uh, and we'll, we'll do a little bit more on this next week. Um, where, is, where is Judy? I don't want to embarrass you. Just, just raise your hand, Miss Judy. Haygood. Judy Haygood. Hey, just, well, I'll tell you what, stand up so they can see your face. This is our new church secretary, Judy Haygood, and we are blessed and encouraged to have her. So you, you now have a face with the name, and uh, you'll want to notice on, uh, on the front of the, uh, of the bulletin that our email addresses have changed. So please make note of that. Having said all of that, uh, we have a guest with us this morning who I'll introduce later, but for right now, we're going to stand, and I would encourage you to meet two or three people who may be snuck in without your notice, or maybe you snuck in without their notice, right? So uh, while we stand and greet kids, you can go, you can go to kids' church.
see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. holy. to see you. Holy, 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 you are holy, 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 I want to see you. All right. Amen. All right, so as we find our seats, what I'm about to ask you to do, go ahead and remain standing. And, uh, and you can find a posture of prayer here in a minute. We're just going to have our, our prayer time uh, before we go back in to worship through song. And so, uh, again, what I'm about to ask is voluntary. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. But I know students, you guys come back Tuesday, right? Going back to class Tuesday. I also know that we've got lots of admin and faculty, teachers, uh, staff members who have already been back some of y'all never really left, except for maybe a little, a little break in the middle somewhere. <clears throat> and we also have college students who are heading back. In fact, uh, uh, there's a lot of people who's gonna, we're going to pray for. And, and so if you want to come up here, then you can do that, and, and others will be invited. But right now, I'm just going to ask you to just raise your hand. And if you're around one of these people uh, and you want to just pray for them as we pray, then I would encourage you to do that. So let's just start with that last group. Who, uh, I know we did this last uh, week a little bit, uh, but who else do we have? This is your last Sunday with us because you're going back to school. You're going back to school. All right, Minna is doing that. I know Noah is. Tucker over here. Uh, Rayleigh right here. And so we're going we're gonna to pray for them. Uh, students, you're going back Tuesday uh, here at Blanco, and you're or there at Blanco, right? You're in Blanco schools. Uh, and you just say, hey, pray for me. Pray for me as I go back. If, if you want someone to pray for you, just raise your hand. No, some of y'all are just like, and, and there's babies over there. We're going to be praying for them. Thank you, Kenya, for reminding us about that. All right. Faculty. Yeah, that was my fault. Faculty, faculty, staff, anybody, you're, you're going back or you're bent back. You're, you're, you're receiving kids Tuesday, and you want us to pray for you. Just go ahead and raise, raise your hand. I can think of two who are missing, two who are out, one getting a last, last shot at granddaughter duty, right, is going back. All right, so we're going we're gonna to start praying for those three groups, and then, uh, and then as we go in, I just encourage you, if you want to grab somebody around you and pray as a group, you can, and we're just going to say some prompts as we go. Father God, we thank you for this time. Father God, and whether it's teachers, administration, staff, college students, Elementary, high school, middle school, whatever side of the school coin we are on, there are unique challenges. There are things we're excited about, things they're apprehensive about. As we pray that you would grant boldness, calm hearts, Father God, that you would set feet on the right paths that you would guide them, that you would use your word to light their way. Your word is a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. Father God, those who meditate on your word are like a tree planted by streams of water. You are good. You are faithful. There is nothing that we face that you don't prepare us for and face with us, equip us, hold us through, guide us through. Your ways are good and right and loving. So whether it's driving back to Abilene, Stephenville, Waco, out of state, or whether it's just crossing the street, maybe it's a new school for some going from middle school to high school, elementary school to middle school, the changes can be scary. And so we, Father, want to, want to encourage in your name. We want to point 
apprehensive hearts to the peace that's found in Christ. Father God, that our goals and the things we're excited about would please you. They would not be selfish, self-serving. Staff and administration would serve with joy and gladness. That students can respect and love and encourage. Would you now just take that prayer and just, just add, add to it? Maybe school isn't your worry. Maybe for you it's job or family. The burden of lost family members. Would you just lift their names up to the Lord right now? Father, as we come before you and continue in worship, we thank you that you hear our prayers. We trust these individuals, these circumstances to you. We know that you are faithful. Just remain in a spirit of prayer. Pray as long as you want to as Edward reads the scripture and we go back into singing. Today's scripture, 2 Timothy, first verse, 8, first chapter, 8 through 12th verse. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit.
King is coming soon. Spirit lit the flame, 
Now this gospel truth of old shall not heal and shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father. you father and you have you have given it all father i thank you so much for these these around me father i ask that you would be with chris as he brings our message uh, as we meet him we welcome him father i thank you very much for him uh to be here uh as pastors walking up i get distracted you know that Father, but you can take all of that, all the distractions, and you can just wash those away. Father, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm sorry, brother. I thought your eyes were closed. I didn't know you saw me. <laughs> As many of you all know, um, Heather, me, the kids, we had the privilege uh, and thank you for just the time off last week, and so we got back into town yesterday, uh, but I have the privilege of just introducing you to just a good friend of mine, mentor. Uh, Chris Osborne has pastored for over 40 years, 33, 32, 33, 30, 33 of them at Central Baptist Church in Bryan College Station, Texas, where he was my pastor from 95 to 96, and, uh, and since that time, he has poured into the lives of many, including uh, just a whole generation of, of young pastors, and we got to, you know, every, every year had opportunity to meet over a weekend. Um, and now, uh, in his retirement, he's enjoying a new second career as the pastor of preaching and pastoral ministry at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And so it's my joy to just get to share him with you as he brings us the word. So Chris, come, come and share with us, brother. No, I appreciate being here. Um, I have known Bill and Heather. My wife and I have spent years with them now. We meet uh, once a year with different pastors and wives. And I can tell you three things that are true of them that I don't hear from every pastor I've met. They love Jesus. They love each other. They love the church they're pastoring. I don't always hear the third from a lot of guys I meet with. So, uh you enjoy those three things about your pastor's wife. I want you to open your Bibles. We're not going to stand because I'm going to work through the text. Revelation 5. And I want you to get all excited. We're not going to learn who the Antichrist is. The rumor is that he's already here and that he bought the Dallas Cowboys years ago. I, uh, it's not true because the Antichrist is successful all the way until Jesus comes back. So we're pretty sure it's not Jerry. We have any Aggies in here? Oh, Aggies. Uh, I pastored there for 33 years, man. Um, I did make a discovery. Somebody asked me one time, they said, do you guys do evangelism on the campus? And I said, no. We don't ever evangelize Aggies because 
all Aggies go to heaven. <laughs> no. It's true because in 33 years there, I never met an Aggie that I thought had reached the age of accountability. So they all, <laughs> they all go. Now, Revelation 5. This is for me, now the New Testament guys at seminary, I'm sure would whine, but I don't care what they say. Uh, it is for me the most important chapter in the Bible. Everything leads to it. And if it is not enacted, nothing happens after. So for me, it's the most important chapter in the Bible. And you're gonna have to, we're going to have to work through uh, some metaphors and some colors and some numbers. But they're pretty simple, pretty easy. It's the easiest chapter for me. I actually preached through Revelation three times while I was pastoring and came out with three different theories. So the rest of the book, I have no idea about it. But 1 through 5 and 19 to 22, I'm okay with. In between, I have no idea. But 5, it's pivotal. And we're going to walk through this, so listen carefully. Because John goes through tons of emotion when he hears this. And the problem with emotions, they shift quickly. I remember I was sitting, I was dating my wife. We're in Minden, Louisiana, and I'm dating her. And so she and her mother... Go to bed, so I stayed with her father, Mr. Proctor. We're watching this old John Wayne movie about John, John Wayne flying in World War II. Mr. Proctor begins to tell me how much he flew in the war and different missions that he'd done, where he went to flight school. And I'm sitting there going, uh, oh man, I'm bonding with the man that's the father of the mother of the woman that I'm in love with. And so I get up the next morning, walk into breakfast. My wife is not awake, or wife to be is not awake. Mr. Proctor's not awake. Mrs. Proctor's cooking breakfast, and I said, "Man, what is new? Oh, you know, your husband flying in the war and everything." She never even turned around. She said, "He never flew in the war." <laughs> now my emotions immediately changed from, "Wow, I thought I was bonding to, if I shot him, how much trouble would I be in?" John's going to go through that kind of shift in emotions here. It's going to be difficult, but listen to what he says. I saw in the right hand of the one sitting upon the throne. Now, you've got to stop it there. If Jesus is, if, if God's sitting on the throne, what's that mean? Uh, now, I, if I ask a question, it's really not a trick question. It's not like the kid in Bible school where the teacher said, What's furry, eats acorns, lives in a tree, and he looked at his buddy and said, I, I think it's a squirrel, but I'm going with Jesus. So it's not a trick question here, okay? If he's sitting on his throne, what's the, what's the point of that metaphor? If I see him sitting on the throne, what does that say about God? He's in charge. He rules. He's sovereign. There is then, you have to, you have to catch this to walk through the rest of the text. There isn't anything... He can't do. Now, he's got something in his right hand, sitting upon the throne, a book written within and without, sealed with seven seals. Now, so he's got this book. Now, that's an odd phraseology, but in the first century, it was what was used for a last will and testament, which is exactly what we find. <clears throat> when chapter 6, when these seals begin to be opened in chapter 6, Two things occur. Those that reject Christ get horror. Those of, our, those of us that accepted Christ get immense blessing. Adam and Eve lost four things for us. Now, when the Bible says that we die, and that's really where it is, without these seals being opened, we stay in death. When the Bible talks about us being dead, it doesn't mean we don't, that we cease to exist. We never cease to exist. Lost or saved, if you're in the image of God, you live eternally. There is no end to your existence. So death means four things. Adam and Eve lost four things for us. We lost God. They lost each other. Because when God came down, Adam looked at God and said, The woman you gave me, he doesn't name her and he blames her. So their relationship is broken. The world becomes an inhospitable place to live. 
then they're filled for the first time in their existence with guilt and shame and humiliation and more. So they lost four things. They lost themselves, each other, lost God, lost the world. So John understands when he sees this book, that seal, that it's the last will and inheritance, and it's what God wants us to have back. So it's in his hand, right? Okay? So he's sitting on the throne. He's all-powerful. The book's in his hand. It's giving us back life from death. It's in his hand. So he's offering it to us. So he desires for us to have it. So the question is, right? If he's all-powerful and he wants us to have it, and he's offering it to us, then why doesn't he open it? He doesn't. Wants us to have it. He's offering it. But he doesn't open it because he can't. He's the one that sees it. He told that and he the day you sin, you will die. If he opens it now, it's like, well, I'm just kidding. Didn't mean what I said. That's not the God we serve. There's nothing he ever says that he does not mean. Nothing he ever says he does not honor. And he has to honor his own word that the day you sin, you die. You lose me, the world, each other, and yourself. He can't open it. So if you're John now, you had some hope, right? God wants to give you the life that Adam and Eve took from you, but he won't open the book because he can't. So now I'm stuck for eternity. <clears throat> in the old adage of if you're a believer, the only hell you endure is here. If you're a non-believer, the only heaven you endure is here. So John understands I'm stuck in an eternity of death. And so then this happens. Verse 2, I saw a strong angel proclaiming in a loud voice who is worthy to open the seals uh, and, and to open the book and, look and, and loosen the seals. Nobody was able in heaven, upon the earth, under the earth, to open the book nor to look into it. And I kept weeping deeply because there was nobody found to open the book, not even to look into it. Well, sure he's crushed. He has no hope. If you actually had God come down now and say, son, you're going to live eternally without me. That hope is right now stricken from John. <clears throat> he sees a God, our God, who wants to give him what he can't have now. And the only, there's got to be somebody to open it. God can't open it without violating his character. <clears throat> and they've just searched the entire world, universe. No hope. So in the middle of this weeping and heaving, look at verse 5. One of the elders said to me, quit crying. Behold, now listen to what he says. The lion from the tribe of Judah has conquered <clears throat> the root of David. And he's able to open the book and to loose its seven seals. Now, I want you to watch what he just told him, okay? He said three things. There's a Jewish king with great power who's coming to open the book. So John says, okay, good to know. We're good. So he wipes his tears off, sits back. Okay, I've got hope. I can have life. It's coming. There's somebody to open the seals. He's Jewish. He's a king. And he's ferocious. He's tough. So what does he see next? Look at this. Verse 6. <clears throat> I saw in the middle of the throne and the four living beings, and in the middle of the elders, a little lamb, standing as if it had been killed. So he looks up. There's no king. There's no Jews. There's no ferocity. Matter of fact, he's looking at him, not at some massive ram, but some little tiny lamb. And then he, when he looks closer, he goes, oh, wait a minute. He's been dead. And yet he's still standing. So John's trying to process all this. He told me he'd be a Jewish king who's, all, who's powerful. I'm looking at a little tiny lamb that has obviously been killed, and yet somehow is still alive. And then it gets worse with the next two statements. Look at this. 
He has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the spirits of God sent into all the earth. And what does that just say? It says two things about this little lamb, right? Seven horns, he's all powerful. Seven eyes, he knows everything. So now we've got a real problem. He's not Jewish, he's not a king. But if he is all powerful, and he's all knowing, who killed him? Animals don't commit suicide, so who in the world? He's all-powerful. Nobody big enough to overpower him. And if he's all-knowing, nobody can sneak up on him. So how did he die? When there's nobody in the universe that can take his life. One answer alone is that he gave his life up for you. Which is exactly we find in the scripture. They came to get Jesus. They fall back. <clears throat> Peter pulls his sword out. He's going to slice off. He does slice off a guy's ear. Jesus says, put it back in. If I wanted to, I could call my father. He'd have 12 legions of angels. A legion had five to 7,000 men. One angel in the Old Testament in one night killed 186,000 people. He says, I'm giving myself. They're not taking why does he do that? Why in the world would a being who doesn't commit suicide, who is all-powerful, who is all-knowing, allow himself to be killed? Look at the next day. And he came and he took out of the right hand of the one upon the throne the book. And whenever he took the book, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell before the lamb, each one having a harp, golden vials full of incense were the first the saints and they sang a new song saying worthy are you to take the book and open its seals why because you were slain and you bought back to God in your blood this being who allowed himself to be killed when nobody can overpower him and nobody can sneak up on him this being that allowed himself to be killed but has been resurrected did all of that his death burial, and resurrection voluntarily so that he could purchase people back to God in his blood. This is why. I don't care who you are. I don't care who we all think we are. You can read your Bible all day. You can pray all day. But you can never be holy enough to enter God's presence. It is the blood of Jesus Christ alone that redeems us. Possess. And so here's what happened. What happens as a result of it if I put my faith in that? Look at this. From every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, it doesn't matter skin color, socioeconomic position, everybody has a shot at Jesus Christ. And then look at what he says. You've made them to our God a kingdom and priests, and they shall reign over the earth. Now he says two things right here. We're a kingdom and priests. In other words, when, when I put my faith, in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Father becomes my king. Now, I can tell you what that means in two things. Okay, now, I, I, I'm not here to inflict guilt today. It's not my ball game, but I do want us to understand the Scripture. If he's your king, there are two things that will be true. If you look it back at a being who voluntarily all-powerful, all-knowing, allowed himself to be killed on a cross and shed his blood so that he could open the seals to bring back to you the four things you've lost. Then there are two things that will be true. You will hate what put him on that cross, and you will crave what qualified him to die on the cross. If he's king, those two things are true. I hate what put him on there. I crave what qualified him to die there. Those two things. That he's my king. And then he says, we are priests. Not in the sense of Old Testament priests. We're not priests from men to God. We're priests from God to men. Now, <clears throat> not being political here. Don't shoot the messenger. 
I'm just telling you, we are, if he's our king, God's priest to the world. In other words, our job, now listen, don't shoot me. Our job is not to fix our culture. Our job is step into our culture and tell people they're in trouble, but there's a way out in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's our job. So our job is not to make America great again. Our job is to make America understand how great Jesus has always been. That is our calling as his priest. I don't want what put him on the cross. I crave for qualified him to die on the cross. And I want the world to understand what I have in the blood of Jesus Christ. They shall reign on the earth. There's coming a day when everything's fine. And then look at this. I saw. I heard the voice of many angels encircle the throne and the living beings and the elders. Their number was a myriads and myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb to, who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. And every creature in the heaven, upon the earth, under the earth, and upon the sea, all the things in them I heard them saying, to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb, blessing, honor, glory, power forever and ever. And the four living beings kept on saying amen, and the elders fell and worshipped. Say, okay, I know what we're supposed to do then. We chase worship of Jesus Christ. No. You don't ever chase worship. You chase Jesus. And if you understand who he is, worship becomes automatic. They're not chasing any worship here. They're looking at him on the throne. They understand what he's done. They finally figured it out because they longed to look into it. They finally understand who he is, what he's done. His blood's been shed. It was voluntary. He did it to bring these people back. And what we lost, God has redeemed back to us through the blood of his son. And they're looking at him going, he is worthy of every praise we can give him. You don't chase worship. You chase praise. You chase Jesus. Now, so what that means is, if the style of worship is more important to you than the Savior of the worship, you don't get it. We have fought worship wars for years because we're more concerned about how we sing than the one to whom we do sing. Worship is centered in Christ, not in style. So, what does that mean to us? I think three things. Actually, four. I think we need to understand he's our king. We have a responsibility to let a lost world know who he is. We know we, we're going to a good place. We're going to reign with him. And we're going to chase him in our understanding of him. Now listen to me. I have to listen to the text. We're going to chase him, not intellectually, but with our heart. So Jesus feeds one time. He's got 15,000 people following him. He says he's going to feed 5,000. If you had women and children, he's probably got 15,000 people following him. So he looks at his disciples and he said, hey, how are we going to feed these people? It's late in the day. Disciples said, well, AGB's closed. <laughs> we don't have any money, so what do we do? Jesus said, what do you have? What did they have? Anybody remember? Come on now. Yeah, two fish, five pieces of bread. He said, put them out. They feed everybody, 15,000 people. They take up toy baskets full of fragments. They've got everything left. So... Days over, sends people home, puts his disciples in a boat, ships them off in the Sea of Galilee. He goes up in a mountain to pray. So it's about four in the morning. He comes down off the mountain, looks out, 
Bible says they're having trouble because storms come up. We were actually on the Sea of Galilee one year when a storm came up. Our boat couldn't get back to shore. It is amazing how quickly they come. So this thing comes up, and there's no Jewish Coast Guard, right? No life vests. They go down. They're dead. So the Bible says that Jesus walks on the water. Remember, it's interesting. He says he wanted to walk right past them, hoping that they would, from that previous miracle, know he's God, he can do anything. They're safe if he's near, they're golden. But they look at him, and the Greek says that they cried out like a junior high girl in a movie theater. They go nuts. He steps into the boat, stops the wind, stops the waves, says, be of good cheer, it's me. And he makes this statement. It says the disciples were amazed beyond measure. Here's what it says. Because they did not consider the miracle of the Lord. Didn't mean they didn't get it. But the miracle had no effect on them in their heart. Their theology doesn't change when they get into the boat. But their view of Jesus changes from the boat. So maybe... Maybe we don't need any more Bible studies. Maybe what all of us need is a boat ride without Jesus and have him show up. Let's pray. Father, I just ask you simply, is anybody here that has never trusted in the blood of your son? Father, let them do that even as I finish prayer. Remind us through this text who we are, who you are. Remind us what you've done for us. Be our king. Let us be your priest. We look forward to what's coming. Father, I just pray that for the rest of our life, we'll chase Jesus. I ask you that for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. As the worship team begins to play, I'm just going to invite you to pray. And uh, I'm going to start us just as Chris has, has led us in to this moment. And I don't know if you, if you need to start pursuing Jesus in salvation or if you're just having trouble pursuing Jesus. You can't see past the storm. Maybe just things aren't connecting for you. You want someone to pray with you. Gary and I are going to be up here. If you want someone to pray with you, come here. If there's somebody sitting near you who you know, they know your story, they know your struggle, just slide over to them while the music's playing. Slide over to them and say, hey, will you pray for me? I'm struggling this morning. Let's pray for one another. Let's pursue Jesus. Let's ask him to connect the dots so that we know who we're in the boat with. Father God, thank you again for your word. Thank you for this time. We give it to you. Speak to us clearly. Let your spirit move us to pray, to pursue, to trust. So now, as you're in a posture of prayer, you continue to pray in your seat with a friend up here at the steps. And as you do business with the Lord, join the song. Join the song as you finish. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone. This solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving seems. 
Yeah, you can, you can clap. That was the last verse. So <laughs> go ahead. I couldn't find the right button. And someone's like, is that? Is this one more? No, yeah, this is good. Uh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, amen, with his people, singing his praises, hearing his word. Chris, brother, thank you for that. Um, and uh, so, so we're going to dismiss here in a moment. Remember, if you didn't get a uh, bulletin, do that. There were some announcements we didn't give voice to that we want you to know, and those are in there. Uh, the short story, right, was uh, budget two weeks from now. We have a special called meeting to vote on that. And next week is our members meeting and Lord's Supper. John? No more bulletins back there. So I've got one extra over here if you guys want to give it to the highest bidder. Um, and, uh, and just for everybody else, again, uh, it's good to be back with you. Missed you all last week. And uh, we're going to sing a closing chorus. Hug some X on your way out. God bless. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Say